So hi, Elizabeth. Thanks for joining me today. Um, hi, Melanie. So happy hey. to be here. <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited. Um, I have your book here. I always like to show scale too, especially because if anyone knows the size of my head, it gives a proportion, <laughs> or just the average human head. Um, uh, it gives a proportion to see what um, the book actually looks like. So I have your book here, Boy Crazy, and we're going to be talking about that today. So I'm very excited. You and I met each other I think maybe was it initially at a portfolio review online and then the workshop or was it vice versa? I think it was just the, no, it was, so it was first the workshop and then I met you at Santa Fe at the review. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. the um, Santa Fe workshops and then maybe the New England portfolio reviews. Maybe. Oh, maybe. Okay. I yeah. should know this. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I, I met a lot. I'm, of I'm bad about remembering it too. I overlap, <laughs> especially if all of it's on Zoom. It's like, how did we meet? Yeah. It, it feels like a lot of times with these Zoom meetings that 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 I have met someone in person, especially if I meet someone over Zoom a few times. And then I see them in person and it's actually quite startling. It's like, wow, you realize it's the very first time. I'm sure this is a universal experience for a lot of people yeah. um, during the pandemic and beyond. But but you and I are doing this now so we can record it and also because we live in different locations. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about Boy Crazy. Do you want to give a little background for the book for those people listening? Sure. Um, so... It started, I started photographing this project, um, focusing um, on images of my sons uh, out at play um, against this sort of metaphorical backdrop of Eden. Um, I started sort of the conception behind that project right around 2019 uh, when I, a specific sort of awareness uh, dawned on me that um my children were sort of triggering memories of trauma um, at that time, which is when I met you. Um, I wasn't really sort of focusing on the details of that trauma. I was more so just investigating um, the children in a much more sort of symbolic way through image making. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had a body of imagery that I wanted to put into book form. And that's when I know I took the class, uh, the, wor the workshop with you to sort of start understanding the bookmaking process. And um, from there, I decided that I wanted to work with um, a book designer who was Caleb, uh, Caleb K. Marcus, who I know you've worked with before too, and then um, worked with Jonathan Blaustein as an editor. And from there, the project sort of started to take a very different form than I ever expected, which was providing much more uh, context with writing and archival and new images. And that was sort of um, going alongside my own uh, more sort of personal psychological journey. Um, so I decided to finally sort of confront these traumas um, in real time um, as I was making this work and somehow put it together into this final book. Yes, and reading it, here I'll show a few of the of the images that you're talking about, especially like the center image with the text, especially with Caleb. I'm sure he... Um, maybe suggested some of these elements <laughs> that are in there to you. Um, he did, yeah. Image. And it's very, and, and some of the design is um, interesting too. It's most definitely a relationship to how he lays out a lot of his books in the past uh, that I've seen in the past where there's some, a lot of white space and a lot of quiet moments and opportunities for catharsis and to engage with the images themselves. Um, and then there's the whole introductory text at the beginning with images of, um, with a few uh, inserted images, which I know he, that he also likes to do is context images for some of the text that's included. And then there's different materials. So it's pink. So you can clearly see in looking through the book, which is hard to tell in my lighting here, um, that there's a difference um, as you go through the piece and you you end up talking about a wide variety of 
experiences for you, but a lot of it has to do with this, like ideas that came up as I was uh, going through it, of course, is catharsis because art is catharsis. Um, there's also this multi-generational trauma maybe that is mm-hmm. considered, uh, which is a new concept for me, at least kind of starting to explore recently about how do you, some of these ideas and the things that have happened to the parents before, maybe generations before passed down to their children and an awareness maybe that's there, maybe lingering. Um, and then this, um, uh, something that I also think about a lot with, especially with photography books, but this is real life, but the idea of like surrogates that kind of goes through uh, the book. Cause you speak a good bit about um, the similarities of, of your children and, and uh, you know, the, the, where the trauma originated from a man that who you, who you speak about throughout the whole entire mm-hmm. book. So it's, it's multi-layered. Um, it's incredibly interesting and, um, deep. (laughs) So, but I think that the two of you with you, well, the three of you, I guess, with you and Jonathan and, uh, Caleb have made a very interesting object. Can you talk a little bit about the process of actually making the book and what you wanted to communicate through the process of editing and design? Yeah. So I think when I headed into the project, I, somewhat consciously knew that I wanted to make these, make something that accurately or brought about these deeper subconscious thoughts to the surface. And I wasn't sure sort of how explicit I wanted to go with that. Um, and I, so I, I went in with like this vague notion of, oh, well, if I just have these images in a sort of poetic um, manner in a book, people will understand my sort of exactly what I'm thinking or feeling. And it felt like, I just guess I'd also say I went into it knowing that there was some sort of like meat or juice there, but not fully aware of where it was going to go but I kind of had a sense of or belief that it could go someplace further um, and deeper and more complex and so I don't know if this is answering the question (laughs) but Uh I knew that working like that by working with a team we'd be able to elevate it and uh, go someplace a little bit more um intriguing and ideally make something that had some impact for other people and I guess I didn't I didn't realize that it would end up being such a personal journey (laughs) um but it was the process into more like nuts and bolts process um you know I first so first I worked with you and you really helped sort of give this scope of what was involved with bookmaking and sort of all the different ways in which one can go um, with it in terms of everything from budget to how many people you work with to design choices, um, edition choices, so many choices and um, ways to uh, navigate um, or places to navigate. So from there, I think I realized, okay, I do want this to be a um, a piece of art and I need help to get it to this level that I know it probably can get to, but I don't really know what that's going to look like or what that's going to be. And I had also, um, watched the, uh, Griffin Museum's photo book talks, which, um, Caleb spoke at and I liked the way that he talked about his design process and I also liked the books that he had designed so I reached out to him and we started to work together and um, at some point during the after our initial design of it we he suggested that we start to figure out what type of context we want to add whether we want to have a art critic write a piece or um somebody else. And and he said, you could also be interviewed. Mm -hmm. 
and Jonathan Blouse, who might be good at that. And I had met Jonathan also at um, an online portfolio review. See, I can't remember what, <laughs> who was at each. I think it was, because I did quite a bunch, I did a fair amount of those as well uh, during those first couple of years of making work, because that was sort of the only way to get feedback, uh, which was crucial. I think it's hard, you know, as an artist working in an isolated space for a long time, you just, you can get lost. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, we reached out to Jonathan and through interviewing with him, that sort of opened up this idea of writing my own entries. And that just kind of tr- ended up having this domino effect of me realizing that I had a lot of personal work I needed to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I was doing that, it, um, in terms of like your t- comment about the generational, um, element in which you know is already dealing with this idea of hopefully breaking you know not passing down my own issues with trauma to my sons but at the same time my mother approached me and shared her story that was remarkably sort of similar to my own and I realized at that point that this is already sort of by me working on this project shifts were starting to happen in my own life so um, there are lots of different pieces kind of moving in tandem with each other, but this was all happening, working with Caleb and Jonathan, we'd probably meet once every couple of weeks, discuss the sort of new work that I was bringing in, figure out how we could piece this together, go home with our own assignments on editing and sequencing and kind of reconvene. Um, it's a little bit messy here and there, but, um, eventually we kind of like pulled it together. <laughs> Yeah, it, I think it is. I have worked with Caleb some and some other clients. And I mean, if, if of course, I'm always conscious of budget and always encouraging every one of my clients to be conscious <laughs> of budget. And, but if time allows, I think it becomes like a good opportunity for um, a dialogue amongst three minds instead of, mm-hmm. you know, just the dialogue back and forth. Um, they can bring in other other ideas. I think when 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 we were looking at it in the workshop, and I know at the workshop too, there were everybody was excited about your work. Um, all the other students were incredibly encouraging. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, because it is really strong work, you know. But I think you were toying with like ideas of like that whole i the whole i Eden idea and the ideal. Mm-hmm. And um, like the almost like a uh, idea like childhood and the and you were hinting around at it too and you were speaking about some of your own trauma but you were also talking about um, maybe there were even nature nurture ideas too yep. that were kind of playing in there too and like uh, what are our boys naturally just boys or how do mothers and fathers parents play a role in that or the environment as well. Um, and then there's also, there were also the idea, you know, of course, like, you know, when you start thinking of photographing your children, um, photographers like Sally Mann automatically come up and some of the issues related to that, you do interview your kids in here and you do, oh, I just lost my page (laughs) now right in the center. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, it is right in the very center. The essays in there where you interview the two of them, but there's some of the images in here where you um, have chosen to pixelate um, mm-hmm. certain parts of, you know, of their body, their private parts of their body too. So that was an interesting discussion too. Like, how did you, because also there is a question in there where you approach the boys and how they feel about that. And then I think you make this suggestion of maybe the pixelation. How did you end up deciding to use them versus leaving them out and censoring yourself by editing them out versus censoring um, by leaving them in too? Or, mm-hmm. you know, and even if it's probably a, I know it's like a, a very, difficult thing especially for a mother you want to you want to maintain the integrity of what you're trying to communicate but you also want to respect the the boys as individuals right. so how did you end up going about like what were some of those discussions like especially for people so, who may be thinking about projects like this themselves yeah so um 
there were several issues at play. This was probably one of the most challenging um, decisions that I had to make, and I didn't know what answer I would take. But the question of whether I include or just taking sort of photographs of the boys in this sort of they are nude in them usually like from the um, backside but I think I had always thought oh they're so innocent and beautiful there's like no I don't see any problem in showcasing them this way however (laughs) as I started to work more on my own story of trauma um, which involves somebody taking or stealing photographs of myself and sharing them um, in an email form uh, in this sort of like pre-revenge porn kind of uh, way, which is um, described in the book. Um, I just realized that I didn't want to have to do that or sort of mirror that in any sort of way with my children because I was like, you know, these this is a big sort of question that a lot of parents are grappling with and showcase and sharing pictures of their children, regardless of whether they're nude or not. We're having questions about this with just like Instagram and Facebook. If I show pictures of my kids, um, is that my right? Is, you know, some kids eventually get upset and they're like, you t- did this without my consent. However, what is consent? I guess it brings up these big con- questions about consent. Um, so I, my kids knew that I was working on this project. So I decided that a way to approach this was to start having conversations with them and sort of ask them how they felt about it. And I started to record these conversations. um, And then that's exactly what you were pointing out in the middle of the book. There are some of those interviews are included where we're, you know, I, I, definitely tried to bring up questions that somewhat related to the work as well. Um, but in particular, so one of my sons is completely comfortable um, with being nude. And even he's now upset with me <laughs> that the images are pixelated. So he says, and, uh, but me, mom, my other one, he and I together, this, and this conversation yeah. is, um is included in the book, but he did feel uncomfortable with one particular image um, and we discussed taking it out of the book, which he did not want, but he wanted it changed in some way. So I did a couple different versions of altering the image involving like cropping it and some other sort of filtering layering techniques. And um, eventually I tried this pixelation one and that was the one that he gravitated, that he really liked because it reminded him of YouTube. Um, So I decided that that one worked and, um, and in some ways was also benefiting the project as a whole because it was really now even hyper pointing to this topic of consent and what is what is innocent and what is okay and what is not and um and you know it's still like at deep in my heart like I would say I'm perfectly fine or like I really love Sally Mann's work and I think that imagery of children in the nude there's something super beautiful and natural and innocent about it with still potentially a hint at the developing sexuality um in them and I think the bigger question boils down to is again that idea of consent and at what point does it become a problem and I don't fully I don't know the answer so I'm like I hope that this will work I I I do anticipate that down the road there might be some shifting attitudes on their behalf and I've said this to them (laughs) we've had conversations about that and yeah I mean I, I would say I love these conversations that are being brought up between myself and them because I'm not sure I would have had these conversations with them without having made the book, some of these harder ones, but um, 
with uh, my son, I said, you know, you may at some point feel a little bit embarrassed about being in a book or, and he said, oh, I'm already like starting to feel a little bit embarrassed about like my body in the book. And I was like, you, and I was like, I can understand how you might feel that way, but I want you to know that you are beautiful and that you should not be ashamed of your body or your books. So these are some of the conversations that we're starting to have. Oh, wow. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see what That's happens. Interesting that he's already road. talking about body image too. Oh, yeah. 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 And it's great though that, that, I mean, if it is, if it, it's catharsis for you, but it also is providing an opportunity for you to open up these dialogues, which I think a lot of parents don't have with their children in a very natural sort of way, um, to be able to speak to them on their level, but to where, you know, I, as, as, you know, a mother of boys, you know, you, you kind of, you are worried about the, the probably more so than the, than the girl that you're sending out into the world, but the boy you're sending out in the world. So, for that reason, uh, you know, I guess selfishly, I, I would be happy to have that opportunity to be able to speak with them more about it. So I could see how that might open that up a good bit. Yeah, so, um, hopefully. <clears throat> yeah, well, now, like, well, if we get into the nitty gritty a little bit more just about the book itself, mm -hmm. now switch, switch tone a little bit here. Um, <clears throat> what are some of the things that, that, um, like if you were to do this over again, uh, stepping back, what are some of the the positives about the bookmaking experience and what are some of the things that you would change about it or advice, if not change yeah. advice in preparing, like, you know, uh, when Erica Reed, when she talks about her beach lovers book, she wishes she would have taken a little more time for fundraising at the very beginning, even though her yep. book is sold out now. Yay. Oh, but, it has. Wow. Congratulations. To, I have yeah, a copy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, um, so I mean, what are the things or things that you've learned? I could echo that as well. It felt like, um, you know, we, we, I, okay. So that's a good, good point. Um, let's see. I'd like to say that I would come into the process of the design um, with more completed on my end, because I would just say in terms of budgeting, a lot of my budget went towards working with Jonathan and Caleb. But at the same time, I say that, and it's, it's conflict, it's like two-sided because, or twofold on you know, the more I, more time I spent with them, the better the book got. And I don't know if it could get to the place that I'm like so proud it got to without having help. So in some ways it's like, that's where a lot of money was spent. Um, but that money was also very well spent. Um, it's like, I don't, the question of how to cut the budget is, a tricky one because then you get to the um, printing area and of course if you have a nice printer um, I would just recommend working especially with a designer like Caleb for this level um, part two because he was able to point me and uh, to a, a press um, in Amsterdam and sort of he knows them and it was in communication with them I mean, they just did, I think, a phenomenal job of the actual execution of the book. And he made creative choices with like the paper, as you discuss with somebody who understands those choices, is, which I love papers and design, but I still don't have the language or knowledge behind all those choices. So you could take potentially some time to really educate yourself in that, um, but Anyway, so, okay, so the money spent there, the money spent on the printing, um, I guess in some ways what Erica said too. I think taking a little bit more time to figure out how much you want to sell the books for and again, pre-selling them. And I remember talking to you at Santa Fe about this too. And um, in the end, I the pre-sales were the biggest chunk of the sales. So... I think 
putting having more time to build that up and to think about how that would impact him would have been a good wise decision did, and to how, maybe charge more how did, <laughs> yeah how did you pre-sell them um so I did I just sold them through my website like I I, I put out announcements newsletters um on Instagram and yeah really um in uh, most of the sales were made through friends and family. So I think that, and I did sort of factor this in. I, when I decided on the addition size, I was like, how many do I think I'm going to sell? Um, and I actually sold more than I thought I would off the bat. Like I'm running low on my totals. So like maybe I was really afraid of being stuck with too many books at the end. <laughs> how many? But you can only do a second many, edition. How we many did we didn't print? 300 so very 300 small in the addition total mm -hmm. oh okay very small. And, that, and that's that's like this on the small end of what um offset printers are willing to do nowadays but yeah they're, they're still willing to do 250 or 300 which is a very reasonable amount caleb did that with another book that we worked together on and rob stock mm -hmm. also printed those and mm -hmm. i will I do agree. Their printing is amazing. And Caleb really knows like kind of image. I mean, he knows where to place the papers where he can mix mm -hmm. it up a little bit too. So he knows how the signatures will fall. So I, I do agree. There is that expense, but the expertise that's involved with someone who actually knows how to get it there and get it there quick and knows how to work with a certain printer. Yeah. Um, it's it is usually worth you know, it's weight in gold too. Yeah. And, um, and it was, I got, I was there on site, which also helped. So we sort of used, and my husband came with, we, we made that into like a special trip yeah. to Amsterdam, which was really <laughs> exciting. And I think also, you know, informative. Um, I do, I think being there in person also helped because that we did make change, you know, I, was able to see the prints as they came out and made adjustments. And, you know, this project was really important to me. So I wanted it to look the way I wanted it to look. And that was helpful because I had some control over it. Um, but on the whole, I was also really sort of surprised that most of the prints that came out, I was like, oh, this looks great. I don't have any, I don't have any changes for it. Um, oh, wow. Did so, they? Did yeah, have... most. Did you have test prints as you sent to them? Yeah. Or? Okay. Oh yeah. So that too, we got the test. I wrote the wet print test and I saw those and those looked great. Um, and I really didn't have, I don't think I had, I talked to Caleb about it. I can't remember exactly. I might've said maybe, maybe I got two test prints and I was like, are they slightly different? And he said, no. And I was like, okay, my eyes are starting to play tricks on me. But um, whatever it was, I got over there, saw the prints there um, everything was looking mostly good, but there were some adjustments that we made on site with also the cover too. Like I remember trying to get this, like the saturation, saturation just right. So we did a couple versions of that, um, while I was there. And what else would I say about all that? And, um, they, I mean, the books that they publish there are, uh, fascinating and also I mean if, if you just get to go you can see it really is an art form and, and they have all sorts of different art books or even like um they make like I remember there was um they were making a container for a sort of cardboard uh holder for flowers that they deliver as opposed to like the plastic wrap that there was a flower com a floral company that they worked with that they were developing their sort of very interesting mm -hmm. yeah flower holder uh so anyway and so I was just getting to see how they use this print um printing facility in various ways oh what else could I just say about all that I think it's really, you know, you have to, one of the things to keep in mind is your intentions with the book. And you discussed this very well in your class was aligning, again, the intent behind the book, because it might be that you're working on something that you want a very large distribution of, and you want it to be a source of income. Um, whereas mine was more, I wanted to try to 
ideally break close to even and have this be something that would mean something to me, but also boost my career or, um, and then the biggest goal is just hopefully to help other people, um, and make impact sort of in their own personal lives through a piece of art work, which for me is like the most exciting thing in life is to come across other artworks or books that really resonate and make me think about things. So yeah, I knew, I just knew that this was going to be something that was a higher investment that I sort of wanted to treat like artwork. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Similar to making artists. something that goes up on a wall. So yeah. I wasn't concerned about keeping it as sort of a small um, little niche edition that was always in my mind I was like I want to keep it small <laughs> yeah yeah the small edition too but also the willingness to accept because everybody seemed like they always wanted hardbound books in the past mm -hmm. I love this but he does the like an OB binding or Swiss binding with this little wraparound paper yep which allows just for a more more of an open experience with the book uh, for a soft bound book too I always loved the soft bound but I knew I that was another thing I actually I was like oh that's an expense I don't have to go with this the hard cover I don't want it anyway um I'm trying to think I feel like there was a book that you talked about in our class sorry I'm going to get up for a second if that's okay <laughs> let's see if I can find it oh mm. Do you remember it was um, a male artist and his work in Hawaii? Oh, Matt Schallenberger. Yes, I have his book somewhere, but I'm not seeing it. I might have it. I think I might have it. We somewhere. can cut some of this part out. <laughs> yeah, that is fine. Because now I'm like, where is it? I should have just had it out. Oh, it's on my desk. I have like books stacked now. I'm becoming like a book collector as well. <laughs> okay, Here it is. And I must have. Yeah. So that you were talking about, yeah, you were talking to, so the book that you were talking about in the, from the workshop was the Matt Schallenberger's. Yeah. The mm -hmm. leaping place. And I must have, I purchased that and I, that I knew, I think having had that, his book, I was like, I really like the way this feels. Um, and I remember him talking about that too, that it was a way to cut expenses, but, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and well, how did you end up, uh, cause like his, his fundraising, he's, he did a Kickstarter and then he got it to mm -hmm. a certain level. He knew what he could do for a certain level. And then once he raised more money, he bumped it up. Like, how did you yeah. kind of set the, the budget for yours? Like what were some of the considerations? Did you bounce? So things? I would say, I, you know, I also, I would say I, in the beginning of making the work, I reached out to several different publishers. So I got a sense of how much they anticipated it might cost. So with the, and we had discussed in our class too, sort of like the mm. big uh, range. And so with that in mind, I set a budget that was sort of on the higher end but I knew what I decided was I will use that budget for my design and printing costs, but I might not go with like a publisher. I might self-publish mm, it. Yeah. Um, working with Caleb almost was like self-publishing because <laughs> he was starting off his um, print press at the uh, publication company too. So um, he was not sort of charging high fees. I will say if you're working, many of the publishing companies will sort of give you a price, like just like a flat price. Like this is how much it's going to cost to publish with me. And that will include design costs and press and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but you won't have necessarily, it probably depends on the publisher, but you might not have a sort of a high touch um process as you would just sort of working one-on-one -on -one with a consultant and a designer that you know you've independently hired mm -hmm. um that I so I remember just seeing those costs and talking to other photographers and realizing that was not the route I wanted to go and I was like I want to use those yeah. costs for myself and kind of watching it as I was going along and seeing how much I was spending and being like okay we're gonna work 
we're going to make it work um, for that same cost. And um, I just already, you know, I am very fortunate in that um, we have enough money saved. My husband and I discussed the budget. I could cover it all on my own. So it was, we're, you know, hopefully you're going to make this back mm -hmm. in terms of cost. But it's, again, like I said, it wasn't like I'm going to try to make this bunny back and then also pay for, um, it was more of just seen as this is an expense mm -hmm. on the whole. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that this is an expense and here's my cap on how much it can cost exactly. in the end. I think it's good for no matter what your income level or no matter how much money you have mm -hmm. saved to set up yeah. the budget and try and figure it out at least to try to break even with the photo book. Right. And if you have yep. other intentions with it otherwise. Um, unless it fully and, is completely a mark, just a marketing piece. And in some, in yeah. some ways, then some people have it's a, figured to come, in, come down the, on the back end. It's yeah. a very expensive marketing piece, that's if that's the case. Yeah. But, um, but I will say I was, there was something that was, it was exciting. And I was also sort of surprised by and I, I hadn't really thought about this beforehand, which is that so many more friends and people were able to purchase this work than let's say you're going to have a gallery show or you're trying to sell prints, which are usually at a higher price point. Mm -hmm. So having a book suddenly for them is a way that they can participate and support you. Mm -hmm. um, more easily because it is at that lower price point. So suddenly I was like, oh my gosh, you know, all these people are able to take part of my artwork and um, yeah, have a, have a leaper in their collection. Yeah, And that was like, I don't know why that, that thought had not really registered until I started selling it. And I was suddenly like, oh my gosh, everybody is buying this. It was, it was really, um, encouraging mm -hmm. and yeah depending I think actually so when we go back to that original question that you asked down the road this was sort of my baby artwork but I think in the future I might end up cutting some of the costs of the sort of maybe the quality depending on the project um maybe making a higher edition but it's like I'm like I could see I was like, oh, wait, you actually probably could even make a little bit more of a profit. And I know other photographers, and I've done this as well, where you make some certain li limited editions with prints, mm -hmm. and people did purchase that. Um, but on the whole, I just think for everybody, they're like, a book is something I can have in my home more easily. And that plus the cost, it just makes more sense. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah. so that was like a really great way to share the work, if you will. Mm -hmm. And you can have many more books than you can have prints and, right. And, um, <laughs> and also like, I mean, there's nothing, you can't experience what you experience with this book with just one single image on the wall. Right. That's so true it's, so the book itself is an affordable object, but it's also a, a complete experience. It's like an exhibition yeah which, which is a totally different beast than a book itself, but it's a, you know, an exhibition condensed, you know, exactly. even though I don't want to minimize, you know, what I think of books uh, by saying it's <laughs> condensed. Um, but um, yeah, so it's fantastic. I do want to just pull out one thing that you said, if photographers are watching and don't know about this, but you mentioned wet prints, wet proofs um, versus, mm -hmm. you know, just digital proofs. And I think that um, if you can't afford those, it seems like that that's, uh, even though I, what I understand a lot of times, the digital technology and the way they have their presses synced up a lot of times, a lot of pr uh, presses can produce a digital print that looks very comparable to a wet print, but I still feel like I'm a purist when it comes to that. It's like, I want to see it come off. Although, granted, you never know what the weather's going to be like that day or how it's going to dry up, but it's going to be much more true, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, having a wet proof uh, that comes off the offset press versus maybe a digital proof. Um, uh, Caleb was just a little bit like, you, this is what you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you're not going to go to the press mm -hmm. and come at, um, have it come off. Um, I think, 
I mean, I, I felt like going on site was again, sort of like a treat that I, I knew I was going to wanted to do and was going to be another expense, but that's why I sort of made it into this special vacation trip that my husband and I wanted to do anyway at some point was to travel once the pandemic was sort of um, further along and we could leave our kids for a few days. Hadn't done that in a very long time. So that was an opportunity in itself. But um, yeah, it was it was nice to, to have that. It was, sort of, it was a very accurate I mean it, it really did I remember um the images seeing it on thing like it was almost like a relief I was like okay I can see now how these are going to come out I can see what the paper looks like and feels like and the quality of it and I was just sort of pleasantly surprised and I probably at that point could have said okay this is going to be fine yeah um and I approve or make a few little changes but um I don't know I'm not fully sure. I still feel like I'd probably have to be there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I want to else... have the control. <laughs> yeah. Someone else who did the same it's thing the uses an excuse to go see the Rembrandt show, I think, too. So. Uh, that <laughs> was the biggest. Bu- so, okay. We didn't realize that. I would have pushed back and I didn't know that was coming. It opened <laughs> like the week after we were there. Um, and we realized that when we were there, we we're like, oh my gosh, how did we not know about this? And I would have pushed back even further because I would have said we need some time for it to calm down because yeah. it was easy, like the crowds. But yeah. anyway, anyway, so it was still well, an amazing experience. Yeah, <laughs> maybe that would have been too much. And I will also say I was there for the whole time, and that was work. Like it was two very long, busy days. So, yeah. um. It yes, was not. It, it gets going. It gets going, and they work yeah. intensely and and get mm-hmm. it. Done. Yeah. So, any any last words that you would, or anything else that you would want to share that you're thinking of, you wanted to share? Um, I don't know. Just that overall, the experience has been uh, both sort of there were. It took me on this sort of unexpected journey. Um and was so rewarding. Like I, I really had no clue. I just had this sort of inkling in me like, okay, as like a personal goal, I want to make a book, not fully knowing what that would look like. So I do encourage people to, to take that dive and um, yeah, have a sort of budget in mind, mm-hmm. talk to other mm-hmm. photographers about what that might look like, figure yeah. out how you can do that and to work ideally with some other people that you really find um a connection with that you like working with um and that will like lead to really exciting things Mm -hmm. and then where can people I mean I can put links to below the video but where (laughs) can people get the book um people can get it on my website they can get it on uh workshop arts and I think you have some as well but just so those are the three I'm almost out of my coffees. <laughs> I'm on low, it says on my website, low stock. But I know, I know, I don't know how many coffees Caleb has left. Um, I know they're for sale at the Griffin Museum um, as well right now. So. And they're, but they have a book space now too, where you can go and buy they it. They do, yes. Yep. Yeah. Well, good. Well, thanks yeah. so much, Elizabeth. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for so talking. And, oh, well, thank you for helping me. Um, along the way as well so much yeah I'm I'm very happy (laughs) with the object it's beautiful thank you